Hello everyone and welcome to the Grumpy Surfer podcast. I'm the Grumpy Surfer and your host Ads Lyson. And what a podcast we have for you this week. But before we start, the Billabong Pipe Pro has just started. So we have a Grumpy Surfer WSL app league. So all you need to do is download the WSL app, search for the, the Grumpy Surfer podcast and get your team sorted out and uh, see if you can beat me. I'm pretty good at these sort of things. I came second last year. So let's see if you guys can do a little bit better than that. So this week's guest, he has spent an entire lifetime pursuing the things he enjoys doing. He started surfing back in the 60s, picked up a sponsor for skiing and has worked for Solomon, the ski brand, for the past 40 odd years. He's worked with wetsuit brands, producing wetsuits. My guest has traveled the world, skied all over the world, surfed all over the world. And if you have a listen to his, some of his stories, it's been absolutely epic. So please enjoy my conversation with an absolute true gentleman, Eric Davis. Eric Davis, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm pretty good today, actually. Uh, surf's looking really good out there at the beach, and uh, for once the sun's shining, so uh, feeling all good. Mate, you were one of the reasons why I started doing this podcast, believe it or not. There were a few people from North Devon that I really kind of wanted to talk to because you see people like yourself in the car park um, or, or in the sea, and you say hello to them and but you don't really kind of like get any background stuff from them. And you see a little bit on socials, like on Instagram, Facebook websites and stuff. And you see this guy who's done some amazing stuff. You go, oh, I'd really be interested into, into talking to that guy. So thank you for doing this with me. Well, it's fine. I feel a bit like a prodigal son to North Devon because um, lifeguarding back in the, the, the seventies and then going away to Scotland and then coming back again in the, the sort of 2000s and then going away again and then here we are back again for the third time and uh, the final time as far as I'm concerned because uh, I've done the research and this is the best place to be. Well you've given me a little bit of a tour around your house and like we said before it's a little bit of a TARDIS you've got this nice little cottage in Knoll and then you come through the back and you've got five or six different different rooms with different like skiing and surf memorabilia all over the walls and to be honest with you it's pretty epic epic and uh, quite humbling to be honest yeah i think i just try to respect this house because um i think it's 15th century so i wish it could actually talk a bit and i could hear what the people were saying at the times uh, through the ages but uh, i think we're just the caretaker but yeah, it's a really good place to sort of spread out and um, have a boardroom with your boards and a few trophies and sort of lock your ego away in there. Um, then you can have a little fitness area and um, yeah, just make, make the most of, of, of what we've got here. And uh, it's, yeah, it's the ideal place for us because I feel like we're one step back from the madness of, um, you know, the Croids or the the beach and Braunton all gets a bit intense and uh, this is a, a great little escape. Yeah, I mean, this little village around here, like I said to you before, we've done a couple of podcasts with uh, the likes of Ben Ruth and Scott Ranneke and uh, Ash Broughton's a local guy around, around by Rafton. And if you think about it, the the size of where Croydon and Saunton and this North Devon area is really kind of like a small circumference place if you put sort of like a big ring around it. And the the level of surfing and the personalities that are actually in this area is quite substantial, really, for the UK. It is amazing, actually. I mean, just looking at a tiny bit of history, you know, you've still got um, a shaper, Paul Blacker, who's working in a little industrial estate behind us here in Knoll. Um, chapter surfboards used to be made up in the garage of this house there's still resin marks on the floor so uh, th there's some real surf culture here and I think a year or so ago we had all the champion surfers in Britain were from North Devon um, 
we had the longboard champion, we had a junior champion, and we had the women's champion, and and that was in a whole mix of both longboard and shortboard. And uh, you know, when you're up against the the, the might of Nuki and the crew down there, it really did make North Devon stand out. And uh, you know, you felt proud to be a part of all that. Along with your surfing prowess, you've actually spent 36 years working for Salmon as well. So, you know, you've also got a prestigious background in skiing as well, which is quite a big part of your life as well. Yeah, I mean, it was almost linked up luck that that got me into the job. I, I originally trained as a school teacher and... I did it for one year just to complete the qualification and it's still there in my back pocket, ne- never to be used. But I don't know, something about the experience helped me to teach other people. And uh, I thought instead of teaching, I want to become a ski instructor. I'd seen them skiing on a college trip back in, I don't know, 2000. Um, or was it even earlier than that? No, it would have, no, it would have been 19... 19- 1970 well, sorry yeah got my dates muddled there <laughs> <laughs> just a few years yeah just a few years out. so it would have been in the in the early 70s college trip to Scotland to learn to ski and I absolutely fell in love with it that was it the the scene was set as soon as I could get the year of teaching done it was go and just devote myself to being a ski instructor um I did crazy things like we broke into um uh, an RAF camp, Bryce Norton ski slope. I parked the van, threw my skis inside, jumped in, couldn't really see a way out, and was skiing for about 40 minutes before the military turned up with some big dogs and escorted me out the uh, out the ski slope. But uh, it was a, a measure of my determination. And uh, yeah, off I went and became a ski instructor, got into freestyle skiing, which is a bit like I suppose the sort of surfing side of skiing, a bit more free thinking. And um, Salomon picked up on this and and started to sponsor me. And uh, that turned into a a 36-year career path of um, quite a lot of travel on British motorways, but also to some exciting places around the world, um, British Columbia, Japan, Scandinavia, the Alps, either skiing for pleasure or, or testing new new products so for me it was the best job in the world one of my questions was going to be which came first skiing or surfing but Um, by the sounds of it skiing came first no not quite no surfing came first um i've got a picture i think our first ever trip was in 69 to the gower in uh, i had the morris thousand and my mate at school it was in the sixth form then had what he called a malibu board and I said, what's that? <laughs> and once we saw what it was, weighed a ton, had no wax on it, which made the first trip pretty interesting. Uh, surfing was much harder with a, with no wax, but a bit like what, what was going to happen to me at college a few years later with skiing. I just thought, this is it. I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing this. And that those two setups or, or situations or incidents set my path for the rest of my life which was to surf as much as possible and and ski as much as possible and almost everything else was irrelevant it was it was a great irresponsible approach to life but it ended up turning out pretty good and uh and had a great job to go with it did you grow up around here or did were you born and and raised somewhere else no no it was mainly bristol that uh, i grew up but again it was in touch with you know, getting to the the Gower or Rest Bay for surf. Uh, I like going walking and climbing in the hills, um, you know, whether it was the Mendips or up to Wales. So I don't know, the kind of wanderlust was in me. I didn't want to stick around Bristol. I wanted to get out there and I wanted to do stuff um, to do with either mountains or the sea. Was there a family connection to that? So your mother or your father, but were they were they involved in any of that? No, it's quite strange, really. Nobody else in our family, as far as I could see, had any interest in outdoor pursuits. Um, I'm not going to claim I was a rebel, but I definitely had some different genes to everybody else. Everybody else was sort of doing the straightforward, normal stuff, regular career path. Uh, 
all I wanted to do was get this qualification in my back pocket and then disappear and do the things I wanted to do. I was just driven. And I still don't quite know why, because I don't know anybody else in our family that's like that. So I'm pleased I had the uh, the black sheep gene, because uh, it's been a hell of a life. It's been great. Yeah, the the surfing side of things w- was kind of sparked an interest with me because we had a little conversation before we started this about uh, one of your nemesis was uh, was Jed Stone, who I did the podcast with uh, with last year. And he um, he expressed and told some stories about you know traveling to Morocco back in like the early seventies and and that sort of thing. And once you started to get into surfing, did you do a similar thing where you just thought there must be other places in Europe around the world that did this and, and went traveling there? Yeah, just to quickly touch on Jed, uh, full of admiration for that guy because every time we were in shortboard contests for the English or British champs. He always beat me, and quite rightly so. And then I find out what his possible not-so-secret weapon was, that he'd spent his entire life skateboarding. And I would say, if there's a part of my education (laughs) missing, it's skateboarding. And he was just so much more manoeuvrable and flexible. But uh, I think I'd like to uh, challenge him to a longboard contest. But uh, getting back to your point on travel... um, Lifeguarding on the beach at Croyd in the the 70s, you know, people would then start to talk in sort of September time. Well, where's everybody going for the winter? And uh, obviously I could see the skiing side for me in Scotland was an option, maybe from January. But to fill the time between September and January, people were talking about going to Barbados, talking about going to Morocco. It, It was really just working out what you could afford and uh, it boiled down to three of us piling into my old split screen van in 75 and we headed off uh, overloaded by a ton of food and boards and stuff and we we set off for Morocco as it got colder we worked our way down through France Spain into Portugal and then finally into uh, Morocco for for mid mid December and uh, it was so funny because you just met half the people you just left behind in North Devon, uh, like-minded uh, or camping down there at Anchor Point. What's a couple of your most memorable stories, surfing stories from from that era? Because there must have been some escapades that went on around that time. Um, I think one of the things was um, waking up to the reality of your own security Um couple of incidents happened around about us that weren't surf related but they were life related that where to the people around in these countries we had a lot and they had very little and uh, I guess they thought they might sort of share some of our stuff so one night one of the guys got out to go for a pee we were in Canitra parked on this breakwater big boulders all around and you just clamber out the van and and he'd go for a pee, but this New Zealander guy that was with me, Mike Heron, uh, sadly not with us anymore, a uh, great character, a, a, a Moroccan guy pulled a knife on him and wanted money. And uh, Mike was just stood there in his pants and he said, I ain't got no money, <laughs> you know, get away from me. And uh, in his confident New Zealand way, he he sort of got got away from the guy with the knife. So after that, we all took it in turns to sleep on the outside of the the van, the outside part in the bed. So there's three blokes in one bed, fun. And uh, the the benefit of sleep on the outside, there was a bit more space, but but you had the bread knife. Now, that was your arms to keep away anybody that was trying to attack us. And the other weird thing about security was we were camped with a group of cars and vans one night and even a tent next to us. And when we woke up in the morning... The tent next to us had looked like what I call a Chinese prayer flag. It was 50 pieces of flapping nylon in the wind. And the the thieves had come in the night with very sharp knives, razored the tent within inches of the, 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 the people camping in the tent's faces, stolen passports and money, but nobody woke. 
And even more bizarre, next to that was um, a Triumph Herald car um, with a dog in it. And the thieves managed to take the rubber strip off the window, um, get the glass out in one piece, skilled operators clearly, stole money and passports, and they gave the dog some meat laced with, with cannabis, I think, because the dog was as cool and calm as anything and was as a useless guard dog. So we just sharpened up our um, <laughs> our security a bit and just awareness and, uh, you know, nothing to do with surfing. I mean, surf story-wise, I think um, the one that sticks out in my mind is um, I bumped into this guy who was ex-European surf champion and, again, one of my great competitors in Masters contests, longboarding, was um, Keith Beddoes, real character from Newquay. And um, he was saying, oh, you know, anchor point, you know, that's, that's weak and feeble. And these beach breaks, these reef breaks, we're, we're all going out at killers. And I, just the name of it put me off. Um, but it was the next bay, Killer Point or Killer Bay, because killer whales sometimes go in there. If that wasn't enough already to start to scare me that the waves were definitely bigger and beefier and where the waves went in was just big sea caves so the white water washed right into these caves and I just thought I don't know if I'm up for this anyway they persuaded me to go and um, another guy was with him I think his name was Mick and he was a bouncer in Newquay big solid guy and he put us all at ease because he went over the falls on his first wave, complete wipeout, washed in a bit, managed to paddle back out. And he was just laughing. And uh, that just put my, my ease. And uh, I really enjoyed the session then. So I went from extreme fear of killer whales getting washed into caves and not coming back to actually having an absolute blast. And uh, thanks to those guys for dragging me in there and... Uh, and also put me at my ease. It's quite funny, really, because you talk about surf travel. I've been to Morocco a couple of times now, and you were talking about traveling there, you know, back in back in the seventies. And but people are still traveling to Killers, Anchor Point, mm. you know, that Tagazu area. Mm. People are still traveling there now. So back then, that you, you know, you didn't have these wave storm guides, or you didn't have magic seaweed and all oh. this sort of thing. So where where did the where did the idea of going down to that area instead of going to some other places like around how, how did you get to be told about that place i think it was uh croyd was a bit of a magnet for for surfers there used to be the thing where the aussies used to arrive in london and go to australia house and when you could park in london anywhere Australia House, I think, was surrounded by VWs that were either for sale or going to be for sale. So these Aussies would buy up a van off another Aussie that was flying back home and they'd say, where are you going? They'd say, oh, we've all just come up from Croyd. So there was this great freight train of amazing hot surfers from Oz coming over, shapers like Bruce Palmer, uh, Kevin Cross, um, John Hall, it was endless. Great characters, great surfers, great shapers. And they were obviously around Europe for the whole year or two. And they'd all start talking about, oh, we're going to Biritz, we're going to Morocco. And I just think the majority of people around Croyd at that time, everybody was saying, well, let's, let's you know, it's, it's going to be a surf trip, bit of a big crew going down there all at different times. And Morocco just seemed to be the one that cropped up all the time. Others went to the Canary Islands. Uh, I never made that. And and others went to Barbados. Um, things like Indo and stuff like that was still early days, I think. And thoughts of Sri Lanka, where I've been, I think was probably war-torn then. So things around the world have changed and it's evolved. Some places are easier to get to and others are more difficult now. There's a question that just floating around in my head and that I've been meaning to ask people at this but you know you, you're the ideal person too and this is going to sound quite sort of like a, a nitpicky thing but when you see all these films like you know back in the back in the 70s of people people traveling and you see them in like these 
you know outer realms there's no civilization around you the park the vans up you know the stories you're telling and what and what jed said as well if you broke a board did you have leashes then you must have had leashes then <coughs> excuse me leashes were just coming in when we went to morocco and prior to that i was <laughs> i was a rebel and i refused to serve with a le- uh, surf with a leash when they first came in and then I had a few swims in some early contests at the Shore Surf Club East Wittering. And because I had no leash, I went out of the contest. So that was the lesson in life that, you know, you got to use a leash. But there's world class surfers like Nat Young and Bo Young and all these sort of guys never, ever surf with a leash. Uh, I even asked Nat Young, I said, do you ever surf with a leash? And he just said to me, I ain't got no dog. You know, he just threw it straight <laughs> back in my face. So if you've got the skill to surf without a leash, good on you. Um, if not, use a leash. <laughs> so my question to you really is, if you snapped a board or, or a leash, or even down to the real basics of taking wax with you, you know, where did you get all that stuff from? Because back then there weren't surf shops. Uh, and I can't imagine there was a, a, an endless supply of it either. No, I think... Nearly everybody that did the Morocco trip had two boards. I took a six-foot fish, which I thought I'd hardly ever use, but in fact ended up using it 90% of the time. And I was told to take um, a pintail for point break surf, and I had a 7.6 shaped by John Hall tiki board, which I probably used half a dozen times. So most people had a backup board if they snapped one, leashes were more interesting because to start with there weren't any and then they weren't very reliable but people got creative some people just had bits of rope you know you just had to do and then everybody took a repair kit with them of some kind to even stick a board back together and in the downtime during the day when you were maybe just recovering after surf sessions it was almost quite interesting you know people doing board repairs um um some people were repairing snap boards or re-resining in fins. Everybody had their own materials with them. Um, I spent a lot of my time just sticking my VW split screen back together because I knew at the end of it all I was going to have to get back to Scotland. So uh, I think we all became quite expert at fiberglass resin repairs on boards, vans and everything that broke. Yeah, that's one thing, you, again, if you use the um, if you use the comparison of what is in very much the social media these days is surf films and edits is you see these guys doing these amazing surf sessions but you know you don't see what's in that downtime either and you know i've been on plenty of surf trips you know over the 26 years i've been surfing and and it's kind of like go and get something to eat or you just sat down on the beach like chilling out or you know you find something on the beach whether it's a barrel or something like that you run up and down the sand dunes rolling down with that or you know whatever there's there's some shenanigans that you get up to right when you uh w- when you're not doing much when you're waiting yes yeah, so surfers always seem to get creative like either zipping somebody into a board bag and then pushing them out into a, a shore break i've seen all that on the films um One thing that we did that springs to mind, I was lucky enough to get on um, a film surf trip called Different Soul with six or seven other longboarders. And we went to Costa Rica and uh, part of the deal was they hired this three-masted yacht that was um, belonged to the president of Coca-Cola back in the 1950s. It was a classic old ship. So we anchored off Ollie's Point right up on the Nicaraguan border and the waves were just perfect. Right-handers, peeling every day, throw the boards over and then just paddle into the lineup because we were already outside. But in one of the downtimes, we thought we'd seen alligators or crocodiles just as we'd finished the ride and there were lagoons up behind um, the beach there. So we thought it'd be fun to go and look for crocodiles as you okay. do. <laughs> individually i don't think anybody would have done it or gone but because it was a group of surfers everybody was up for it so we landed paddled in landed and uh, started walking back up into the uh, lagoon area and sure enough we could see them some were just with their eyes looking out the water others were on the land uh, soaking up the sun and we thought well 
we'll just walk slowly towards them but make sure the way to run back was clear as well and in fact we we crept up and um they all ran away from us in the end so uh it was quite of a soft ending to that story you know there was no attack but they were still there the next day when we finished the wave you'd sort of kick out at the end in sort of knee-deep water and you could see the odd saltwater crocodile whatever it was just there in the shallows and I couldn't work out if it was more reassuring if it dived under the water and it had gone out of sight or it was better I could see where it was but either way it was some of the fastest paddling I've ever done to uh to get back out to the lineup it's not really that reassuring though is it sometimes because i i surfed um i went to costa rica when i came back from afghanistan um a few years back and uh, we went to tamarindo and the river mouth that comes out the southern side of the town you know you got the salt the salt rock um the salt water crocodiles that are there and you always hear these horror stories of it and uh i'm in the water i'm my, my wife this is going to sound really weird coming from someone that surfs that she doesn't like the beach and she doesn't like the sea that much because she, she used to be, you know, quite a high level swimmer. So she's really competent in the water. She's like a fish. But whatever she can't see under the water, she absolutely hates. So if you go to the beach and she, she went, we went to, um, we went to, uh, we went to Thailand and we went on a boat trip and there was loads of snorkeling and stuff. I was like, well, come on, let's go. And she was like, I ain't getting off this boat. Really? So there's me, you know, going up and doing all this snorkeling and she won't get in the water. Everybody's got their phobia. I mean, you know, and you have to disrespect it. That's that's the way they are. Just one other slightly sharky story was, uh, did the trip to Oz and New Zealand and um, we're at Byron and I went and rented this board, paddled out to uh, a, a spot called the wreck and it's just more or less right out the front of the seafront so there's these two other people and a girl surfing there just average surfers having a bit of fun waves weren't great but i was hooking a few and getting used to the board i'd hired and then i'm suddenly aware of this jet ski absolutely screaming straight at us um you know with lifeguard colors on it and a bloke waving at us so uh sort of paddled back outside and it was coming to talk to us and uh he just said, sir, I strongly advise you leave the water immediately as there has been um, a great white sighting and uh, you can't go fast enough. Uh, go now. And uh, again, some of the fastest paddling I've ever done in my life to get the hell out of there. So I'm not a big fan of Australia. I've done it twice now. Um, the east side, all the way Sydney and up that way, surfed all the beaches that were surfable and I could find waves and it was fun and Margaret Riverside as well but a combination of powerful waves and and, and what's lurking in the water um, I won't be returning to Australia I don't think so uh, anyway I couldn't face going there now after we lost the ashes he's going to get ridiculed from all angles so uh, I've done my Oz trip thank you yeah I, I'm, I'm very I'm very much the same I, I I just can't do it. I've uh, we've done done a few trips to the Maldives and and places like that where you got your your black tip uh, reef sharks. I mean, you know they're about three or four feet, but they only really come out in the mornings and stuff feeding yeah. on the fish, and then you don't you don't see them again. So that's about as extreme as I can get. I, a friend of mine um, did the trip to um, did the trip to South Africa, and he paddled out with a couple of guys to uh, to a reef, and these two guys were paddling back out, and they were like, "Where are you going?" He said there must be a 14 foot great white out there and they were like i could not imagine what that would be like you know sort of like halfway paddling out to somewhere and they go fuck i'm gonna get back yeah no you've got to take the warning signs and um you know take your humble pie with you and retreat back up the beach but uh, somehow in costa rica it feels safer maybe it's a false opinion i've got but i think everything over there is well fed and I've never really been bothered by anything remotely looking shark-like. I mean, I've had lots of tuna fish around me, big ones thrashing about, and, and all the fish that they've scared jumping all over me. You know, the sea just boils. But I don't know, I feel maybe it's just that beach break where I go. It, it, it feels safe and I can relax and get on. But I never, ever felt relaxed surfing in Australia. Wherever I went, I just didn't feel relaxed. 
Who are the characters that you surf with around Australia? Because, you, you know, you spoke about Nat Young and uh, Bo oh. Young's actually shape, shaping at the moment. He's yeah. down in Bantham no, way, so. I was just, uh, just me and my wife were traveling up through Oz. It was just the people we met. No, okay. this uh, Bo Young and, and Nat Young, I met actually here in Britain. Um, I think Nat was doing a book signing way back in Surfing Life in Plymouth. And uh, I went along and that's when I asked him about the, the leash. And then Bo was over in the Gower surfing in a contest, um, a British Longboard Union contest. Um, and, and we, you know, it was great just to go up the pub with these guys and just talk normally about surf, board shapes. You know, the, yeah, they look like rock stars, but they talk like normal people when when they're down the pub and actually watch Bo Young in a European contest at Biritz. It was huge, absolutely massive surf off the scale and he lost his board with I bet in a quarter mile swim we were looking at it from above and I've never seen a guy read the rip and currents and waves so well considering he couldn't have an aerial view he just seemed to pick up all the water that was moving to the beach and he was reunited with his board in what seemed minutes and then with his same rip and wave knowledge he was back outside again competing in 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 the in the in the heat and he and he went through and i just thought that you know the word waterman is used quite often and i thought this guy is a true waterman he really knew what he was doing and uh, to witness it was amazing and uh, say to have chatted with him coolly and casually in a in a pub in in, in the gower as well is is great it's all part of the surf experience we've talked quite extensively for the last 20 20 minutes about uh, surfing which i'd like to go back to but um let's just spend a little bit of time talking about your your skin career because you know it, it's hard to miss a, really because you know i'm sat here talking to you and there's at least three pieces of ski memorabilia but with you on the front of magazines and pictures of back in what looks like the 70s or 80s and stuff mm. so um let, let's talk a little bit about that you know did you did you compete and and, and how did the sponsor for salmon come along as well i know you touched on it earlier yeah it was um again i said earlier i was driven and i sort of fast tracked myself as best i could to get that instructor's job and uh, i managed to get taken on by um a, a ski school in scotland called the badenock ski school that was run by um a guy called rudy and uh, he had a a head chief instructor called Arthur McLean, who again, sadly, is no longer with us. But these guys were great characters. And um, I think they thought because I had school teacher training, um, I could take school kids for their lessons in in the sort of <laughs> off white snow at the bottom of the mountain. It was called Sludge Gully because the peat dyed the snow brown. And it's where the flattest snow was, where I used to take these kids and... Uh, Arthur, who was also a comedian and folk singer in the evenings, he said, look, Eric, he said, all you've got to do is stay one one class level above the people you're teaching and you'll be fine. All right. But if the class catch you up to where you are, you're going to have to improve even faster, you know, in the lunch hours and stuff. So I was just so stoked to get a start. I was paid pennies uh, to teach kids to ski on brown snow and uh, you couldn't get a more humble beginning, but I just loved every minute. And, um, you know, you'd walk down into the, the resort of having more wearing a ski instructor's jacket. And you thought, I think I've gone to heaven here because life was pretty easy. The, you know, the chat up lines were easy. You always got a beer at the bar and uh, it, it was life was good. Even even being the, the, the king of sludge gully. Um, and then I just started to practice some freestyle that I saw people doing on the slopes, which is more like ski ballet, doing jumps, um, skiing in a slightly wild and uh, sort of freer way and not the discipline of racing. And then a contest was coming up and, and I entered it and I'd only been skiing for about six weeks. But I thought, well, if I launch off the jump and do some kind of aerial maneuver and I can try and land it, I'll get some points and I practiced the, the ski ballet, which does sound a bit dodgy, but to be honest, you had to do three disciplines if you even wanted to compete. So you had to do moguls, which is skiing the bumps in a wild style with airs and jumps. You had to do aerials off a big jump. 
uh, and you had to do the ballet. So it wasn't, oh, I'll just do this and I'll just do that. You did the lot, but I practiced and practiced, got better and better. And then Salomon said, we'd like to sponsor you with some bindings, some gloves, some bags and, and stuff. And uh, can you show movies um, on a Wednesday night in the pub here? They said, there's a, a huge banner here that says Salomon Film Festival. You just put that up and you run your 16 millimeter movie projector in the pub. And in those days, smoking was big style. So the, the room was full of smoke. And there was this beam of light trying to find the screen at the other end of the room through the smoke. And um, there were some great movies on there of early snowboarding with a guy called Ted Shred, who used to overtake skiers, which was uh, good to watch. And huge aerial jumps in um, British Columbia off these big wind ridges of snow. And uh, yeah, the pub was full of noise and excited skiers. And uh, then eventually Salomon said, can you come to a trade show and talk? And um, and from that, then they said, do you want to be a part-time promoter? Do you want to be a salesman? And 36 years later, traveled the world, skied in every decent ski place there is, carried on competing, doing the Colgate Palmolive freestyle series. And here's a spooky one. On Monday, I'm actually going to the trade show for ski equipment because they've asked me to come back and do um, three days there as brand ambassador for Salomon. So I just thought I'd finish work, but I'm actually going to go and enjoy three more days of work starting on, on Tuesday. So, uh, hey, life goes on. Yeah, it seems like they definitely want to keep you on board a little bit as well. I think because I still know a lot of the, um, the ski shop owners and they're going to turn up and we always start the, the meeting by exchanging ski stories. Oh, do you remember that snow in Japan? And do you remember when you did that head plant and we couldn't find you? And, and I don't know, you fell down that tree well and we were worried that there was a bear at the bottom of it. And, and it's what a great way to start selling equipment is just to remind yourself of, of the good times uh, that we had and then get down and do some, some business. So yeah, I'm still passionate about ski equipment and uh and surfing and surf equipment it's that's me <laughs> i think it's pretty cool really because there is a, a great comparative between you know skiing and snowboarding um you know on slopes to to surfing as well probably a, a little bit more money uh, within within skiing than surfing currently um purely for the fact that you know the travel to get there the accommodations and you know especially in some of the big ski resorts is can be quite expensive as well um but the, the kind of like the lifestyle and you talking about doing the freestyle skiing where you're kind of going off piste and doing all those sort of things and going to discover different slopes is is very comparable to, to surfing whether it's you know you can find different breaks it's interesting you mentioned that because if i wind time right back to when i first started at salomon i had to make a decision about do i move to scotland and live there and devote more time to skiing but still surf you know i used to surf on the the Banff coastline up to Fraserburgh, and then I even won the Scottish Championships at Thurso. So I definitely kept my, my surfing alive, but my main sort of job in life was ski instructing and working for Salomon. And then at that time, gull wetsuits were massive in, in Britain, and they asked me if I wanted a job with them. And I had to make a, it felt like a crossroads in life. Do I move to Cornwall and Devon? and go with gull wetsuits or do I stick to the belief that there's probably a bit more money available not to be greedy but to be able to travel and get to more places if I went the ski route and I, I do remember that day and for quite a few years afterwards I still questioned myself because I kept thinking oh, I could be surfing um, I'm standing here instead in a blizzard in Scotland and this is pretty evil, but um, that's what I've decided to do, make the most of it and, and go with it. And in hindsight, it was the right decision because I've certainly kept my surf uh, life alive and um, managed to get a career out of, of skiing as well. So it's just knowing in life to make that right decision. I'm sure everybody listening 
has had those moments you think oh i'm gonna chuck this job take the risk i'm almost the person that would say do the research and if if your heart says do it just go chuck that job go and find something more interesting because it is out there somebody's doing it and it could be you do you almost feel like you've found that perfect work-life balance you know back when you were surfing and and um doing all your um doing all the scheme promotion as well where you'd you'd follow the waves maybe during the summer or you know back here in the uk whether it's traveling but then you know during the winter season months in in europe you know you're up on the slopes and you're promoting um you know all the branding stuff the skis the bags the you know the poles all and all the things that come with it yeah i always tried to <laughs> work the seasons so obviously try to do the summer in north devon on the beach as lifeguard and then to scotland for for ski instructing and then to france for more ski instructing but in the end i had to put some roots down and that goes back to that decision of snow or wetsuits whichever and we um we built a house in scotland in the end so we dropped anchor and built this house in a in a scottish glen and um luckily my wife annie who's super tolerant helped build it with friends and tradesmen that were around and uh, lots of hard labor and, and in fact we produced twin boys up there they were born in inverness hospital so we we felt like we were a bit on the frontier in this scottish glen because it threw some wild weather at us but um yeah in between family making enough money to live i still seem to manage to get up to the coast to surf when i could and um being involved in skiing whether it was selling stuff on the road around the shops it, again you'd still get time to test stuff and and get your own ski time in as well so yeah it's a tough one the the balance because it usually swings one way too much and and not the other so yeah the word balance is the clue you rarely get it exactly right it, it that's that's the dream <laughs> keep the dream alive and keep balancing how did you find that over the years with, you know, the, um, you, you bringing up two twin boys, you've got your wife, you, you, the, the house, and obviously she's got the things that, you know, she likes doing, she's got her job. And um, it, it's, it's something interesting that, that I always think about because, you know, it is quite a selfish thing that, you know, we endeavor to do. Surfing's a very individual thing, um, whether it's doing it on your own or, or whether you're doing it with friends potentially skiing is as well because the, you know at the end of the day you got two planks on your feet or a snowboard and um you know you're on the slopes on, on your own trying to trying to balance that when there's a good swell coming through you know we're talking about that now you know i'm, I'm in the last couple of days of, of of being in the military and trying to balance all that and you know my wife lives what 62 miles away but yet i'm here in north devon and i'm you know doing a couple of things at work to tie things up and I find sometimes it's it's not difficult, but I'm almost kind of like being necky because I want to do things that that I that that I enjoying. But you're almost kind of like, am I seeing those people off too? You know what I mean? No, I know exactly what I mean. In fact, I think surfers are probably the most selfish people in the entire <laughs> world, and I include myself in that. And when you're not surfing and not skiing, you've got to try and make up for that selfishness and try and spread some love in the other direction. And luckily, again, with Salomon, we were able to get out to the Alps and take the twins with us every year for, for snow time. You know, even when they were just four or five, you know. We ran this program with a hotel that it was low season. They couldn't get anybody in the hotel. So they said, oh, what if we advertise you can test salmon skis? All part of the deal. There'll be a salmon technician there. He'll set your bindings up, give you some advice. Um, so that's exactly what we did. And luckily, there was enough space in the hotel that could take the family as well. And then I had good links with travel companies so we could do quite well on flights. So again... Although Salomon and work was quite selfish with my time, I tried to spin it with some spin-offs for the family and they got to go skiing, they got to go to France, they got to travel. So 
Yeah, it's uh, it's tough when the name of the game in surfing and skiing is to be as selfish as you can to get the best waves, the best days when nobody else can. It's yeah, it can be quite uh, quite destructive. You uh, you mentioned earlier about um, golf surfboard uh, wetsuit, sorry, um, and I know you've had uh, you know quite a lot of input with the guys at Second Skin um, and also the Museum of uh, British surfing uh, as well can you talk a little bit about those yeah, things yeah I mean wetsuits the first of all in Britain you can't go surfing in fact you can't even barely go in the sea apart from these new hardy cold water swimmers without some kind of wetsuit for any kind of length of time you need a wetsuit so they're a part of the whole scenery and culture and um, obviously going to surf in Scotland we needed thicker wetsuits and in fact, by knowing Dennis Cross from Gull and Andy Shollock from Second Skin, um, I started to make wetsuits up in Scotland in, in the house we built. Um, we couldn't afford to build the whole house, so we just floored the upstairs and it was like a little wetsuit factory. I had learned to do gluing, double gluing, stitching, finishing um, and was quite successful because they were all custom made, which is what Andy Shollock is famed for at second skin so these guys helped me with advice and some uh, procedures and uh, that was quite successful then i started doing wetsuit repairs and stuff like that and uh, yeah they've always been a part of my life and then salomon went into surfing with surfboards called escore they sponsored some wqs events around the world they were working with all the top shapers that was exciting times and they were developing wetsuits. And because we were the sort of key nation for wetsuit development, because the water's cold and there were innovative people here that were, were doing wetsuits, I got called into a lot of the design meetings for that. Uh, and I'd had experience of making my own wetsuits as well. So, yeah, wetsuits has been quite a key part of of my life, if you like, all the way from early days in Scotland to even to now i'm blessed that xl wetsuits helped me out very nicely with uh, with their suits which right here right now i think are the best there are they've they've nailed it with the stretchiest neoprene that you can buy from japan and my old aging body fully appreciates that because i reckon i gain an extra half hour out there to annoy people and catch waves when i think a lot of other wetsuits you, 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 in fact, it's like going to a gym wearing some people's wetsuits. You're not going surfing, you're going to a gym. But enough of that. I forgot what the question was. I just rambled off there about the wetsuit vein that runs through my my life. No, I mean, you kind of lead it on to a little bit about, you know, what I wanted to come on to really is, um, so don't take this the wrong way. No. Um, I met you quite a few years ago and I say I met you I first came across you when I was surfing at Saunton oh, I was probably rude <laughs> and you showered at me and I, and, and, and I, I always tell this people uh, tell this story because I'm like Does, do you know that Eric Davis he's like yes he just like shouts at you if you don't get out of his way so what what happened was I was on uh, I was on an old old school um, custard point log and you taken off our, it was mid tide uh, yeah. at Saunton. Cave time. Yeah, sort of cave thing, yeah. time. Yeah. And uh, you taken off, and I was paddling back out, but I thought it was further enough out the way not to get into people's way. And you took off, you did a bottom turn and just turned and came down the way. I couldn't hear what you were saying because I had like earplugs in. And all I could see is your mouth moving. It just sounded like, get out of the way, get out of the way. I paddled back out to the pack and you came back out through the rip and you just sat there. And this is where I thought it was quite funny. He said, that young lad back there on the red board didn't get out my way. And I was like, that. he said I was young. I think I was about 36 at the time. I was like, I've never been called young in my life. It was amazing. So my question really is, um, you're quite a controversial character sometimes in the water. Um, but I think it's because you've got a very sort of like old school mentality. How would you find the comparisons between sort of like the, the um, and what I mean by like old school, I don't mean like you're old because I don't mean it's that It's only a way. number. <laughs> it's only a number, right? I mean, kind of um, 
you know, there used to be back in the day when people weren't surfing, you know, you earned your, you know, you earned your waves in the lineup. Um, you know, if, if you were new to surfing, you kind of sat back down the point or the lineup a little bit and caught those waves, the scraps of everybody else and everybody else who's like earned their place, you know, is, is in the main place. How do you find the comparison now from sort of like the mentality that you've grown up with to, to what it is today? I think that's true to a point where people are, are respected in the lineup. I think that's kind of gone into the past now. And I think with the modern outlook is everybody is now equal. Um, but some people think they're more equal than others. And to me, the cardinal sin is to drop in on anyone. To me, if you don't know that rule, then something's wrong. You should have found that out along the way, either at surf school, your mates tell you, or somebody tells you. And if people drop in on me blatantly, then they're definitely going to get a mouthful. Although more recently, I've tried to do it more by education and just say, look, you just don't do that. You know, if you drive like that on the way here in your car and you pull out in front of somebody, you're going to die. And I said, if you do that here, you're going to get run over by somebody either in control or out of control. But, you know, the drop in is the ultimate crime to me. So I think through my contest surfing, I end up with quite a high wave count. But I like to think I've earned that wave. In other words, I've read the sets, I've read the surf I've worked out where to be without getting in anybody's way and I can claim the wave legitimately but I have done a couple of things to give myself if you like an unfair advantage um, once they've decided now I'm mainly a long boarder I've gone for the longest board that I think I can still turn and be fun to ride so that is now 10 feet long 23 and a half wide three and something thick it's pretty lightweight. So guess what? I can probably take off further outside than most of the pack of surfers there in the right place. And in my opinion, legitimately claim that wave. And, you know, at Saunton, you can get a 200 yard ride if the wave is good. And really only you can mess it up or a whole string of people either just sitting there like, marker boys that do nothing to get out of the way or people trying to drop in and that's possibly using your word I become controversial because the people that just sit there like a marker boy are really stupid because they, they, they've not learned have they you you should be paddling out the way of the surfer coming and preferably paddling to the white water leaving the face for the surfer to enjoy and it's like what you call internal management quality. I'd expect that done to me and I would do the same to that person. Get out the way, paddle to the white water, let them get the face. So the the, the, the marker boy surfers definitely irritate me and um, the drop-ins, they're cardinal because they'll even do eye contact. I often give them a warning, you know, like, whoa, you know, a shout. I'm here, okay, with hoods and earplugs. Yeah, it's a bit different, but we still got eyes. We're not wearing, you know, blinkers. So a quick check, left and right. And if you have dropped in, kick out immediately. Don't play the game of, oh, I'll have a couple of turns and screw up the face for you and maybe drag the wave down. Kick out. But best of all, look and don't drop in. So controversial or not, that's... That's what I do, and judge me on that. And I think what it also comes down to as well is that as a as a British nation and um, as British people, we are very um, we're, we're not very uh, confrontational people as well. So you know, when you've got a guy, you know, and, and again, this is no detriment to you whatsoever, but when you've got a guy like you that is like speaking out, people kind of think, well, who's this number? Because they don't yeah. know you, you know. But it's because you know, when someone comes over to you, like like for me in the gym, right? If I see somebody that's doing a squat wrong, I'll go over to them and say, look, you know, put your shoulders and your knees over your feet and blah, 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 and all this sort of thing. They probably don't know who I am. But then they, they probably turn around and say, who's this, who's this guy here? Yeah, what's you he know? all about? But it's only because we're trying to help yeah. somebody else. 
but they probably see it in a negative light as a positive light. Yeah, and I I've, mean, I try and coach people and just go jump in slightly the subject. I surfed at a place called The Pass in Byron. And if you're lucky, you can catch it right at the point and you'll get a 250, 300 yard ride. If you read the wave, cut back, trim, cut back, trim. And I got one of those waves, but I think I got into double figures of people, what I would call, I was coaching as I was surfing. Either marker boys sitting in the, the water uh, or surfers trying to drop in or people chucking their boards away. It was one of the funniest waves I've had because I think, I think that's the 10th person I've given advice to on one wave. And you just think, <laughs> and that was Oz. In theory, everybody over there knows what they're doing. And uh, it was just, it just made me laugh. I just thought, I sh they should have paid me money. I've just coached 10 people on surf etiquette. But there you go. I've definitely noticed over the last two years since the COVID lockdowns, um, which we won't go into, but there's been an in increase, influx in the amount of people that have taken up surfing because oh. I think people realize that you know an outdoor pursuit is it is very important and i remember i think it was last summer um you know i, I took my log down to saunton yeah. and um you know i'm not i'm not the best surfer in the world but you know i can i can handle longboard okay you know and going down the line and like you say people not getting out of the way it almost turns into like turning practice Slalom. stalling yeah. practice because yeah. you're you're yeah. almost kind of just trying to get out of people's ways and they're paddling the wrong way. They're not <laughs> paddling into the white wall. They're paddling into the face of the wave, which is where you want to go, whether it's running onto the nose or coming to do a little cut back to the white wall yeah. or whatever. And yeah. uh, there's, there's definitely an, a, a, an increase in that, which is why now when I go surfing, I try and, if I can, and the conditions persist, is find the most remote places where nobody else are going to be. Which is difficult. Yeah, well, I mean, I've put a few, you know, things out there on Instagram or Facebook, and I've, I've shown like the temperature on my van, like minus three and a half, and 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 a picture of my alarm for I don't know a five thirty or a six thirty, or I even put one up at four thirty. I went anything to get away from the crowd. So I'm right with you. You can make your own luck. But going back to your other point, I I think. I nicknamed them the furlough surf club because the, the volume of surfers jumped by about 40 to 50 percent, possibly 100 percent some days at Saunton. I've, it, it's funny, it was almost like the tube. You see people on an escalator at the tube in London, there was the escalator of the rip and they were like queuing to get into the water to then get into the rip to go out. And I just thought, it's almost comedy out here now and it is going to end up with some some dings and some dents and some bruised egos and yeah try and get creative hike down the beach get up early look for a different beach just just surf smarter really and and be aware of other people uh, the quality phrase that uh, people in california use or it started to be used is called um is a is a val a vulnerable adult learner I just thought it was quite apt, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's got to learn, and surfing's fun, and that's what it should be about. And, um, yeah, it's uh, just thinking about the, the lineup and the crowds. There are certainly some greedy surfers out there, very good surfers. You know, they'll entertain when you watch them surf. But when they paddle back out, they immediately expect to get the next set wave. And if they've engineered it, they're exactly in the right place. Well, yeah, that's OK. But if they repeat that maybe four or five times and everybody else is kind of elbowed out the way, that I could see will irritate people and then people will start dropping in. And uh, I've had a couple of incidents like that. And instead of shouting at them, I just had a, a quiet word. And that seemed to work, actually. I think they realized that somebody had pointed out that they were just being a bit greedy and i'm pleased to say i think they've maybe modified their their behavior well they certainly have with me and i did it politely so it's the way forward maybe but it's the pressure all those surfers all want the dream wave and that's that's the way it is out there
You say that I went out and did some surf coaching out in Guam with um, with one of the Navy carrier groups uh, in September, and we paddled out to this. Um, me and my mate paddled out to this uh, out to this local break, and uh, as soon as we got there, this local guy was like, that, "Are you respectful? Are you respectful? <laughs> Do you know what you're doing?" And, and like me, me and Andy were looking at each other, going, "What?" And I was, I was kind of like. We haven't even caught a wave yet. We're literally just paddled across the channel. And you're getting lectures. And we're getting loads of grief off a guy that actually wasn't particularly that good either. Yeah. He's like on a, like a, a mantra. A, yeah, and I was just like, oh man, this is this just this just sucks. It and it kind of just it ruined the first twenty minutes a little bit because we thought this is going to be super aggro, and and it really wasn't. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd caught a wave and I kicked out and there was this bodyboarder guy there and he was super, super nice local. And um, he basically said that there was a British guy who rented the surfboard from uh, from the local shop and uh, I'd just come out and basically was just taking off on everything. Mm. So he kind of obviously, you know, we weren't locals. He just kind of set the precedent for us and we'd come out and just bought the brunt of it. <laughs> was like that. What a twat. <laughs> it's funny you should say that because Again, just a memory shot into my brain there. If we went to Santa Cruz surfing, home of O'Neill wetsuits, and we'd scammed it because it was two days before we were going skiing up in um, in uh, Heavenly Valley. And uh, we went to this place called Pleasure Point, which is just up the road from Steamer Lane. And when you paddled out, you could suddenly read this gigantic sign across the sea wall um, that if you don't live here, don't surf here. And this is in six foot high writing. And we went, oh, righto. <laughs> so that's interesting. And um, there weren't many in. There was probably about 10 in. And we were all spaced out because it was like a nice point break running through the kelp there. And then this um, slightly Chinese oriental looking guy, every time I paddled for a wave, he paddled inside of me to drop in on me. So we were like dropping in in unison. And I thought, well, once is funny, you know, OK, so let him go. Then next time I get back out, he's there again and he does the same thing again. So I thought, well, I'm reading the sign on the, the wall and I'm looking at this guy. I think, well, I don't want to upset anybody, but I'm not breaking any rules. So in the end, I just steered my board to edge him up onto the shoulder of the wave, but left myself enough time to still re-enter the face and, and finish the wave. And he must have done this three or four times, just kept doing it until he got fed up with me edging him up the wave. But I don't get localism like that, because if he's a pure local and he sprayed that paint on the wall, in theory, he can never, ever surf at another beach because mm. you can't say that. Oh, we're local or, you know, don't surf here if you don't live here because that means you've restricted yourself to one beach in the entire world you can't travel you can't go down the coast so there's like a disconnect with that stupid local mentality you know you've got to ease up and and share the waves so. i think back sort of like in the in the endless summer days um there was a there was a lot of that purely for the fact that people really couldn't afford um electric bikes didn't exist oh, didn't no. You know, people couldn't afford cars or whatever. So, you know, so maybe the, that's it. They literally did surf the one beach and, and they were kings, you know, big fish, small pond and thought I'm going to rule this. And that's maybe that's the way they were. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got guys like Mickey Dora used to, uh, you know, rule Malibu and all oh. those sort of places. But, you know, like I say, they probably couldn't afford vehicles and the vehicles that were there that they did a bit of traveling was probably a, a mate who was a little bit more well off. I mean, I, I, yeah. I don't know. No. But, which kind of brings me on to a, a little bit on your thoughts on, you know, surfing's cultural shift, especially sort of like around um, a, a around this area. Do you, do you think it's developing into um, into like a, a new, I don't want to say new Nuki, because Nuki was the, like the hub. You know, if people came surfing in the UK, they wanted to go to Nuki because it, it was kind of like the centralised place for surfing. But... Do you, have you seen a big cultural change around here? Yeah, there's there's been a massive pivot. I mentioned those Aussie shapers that used to come over, the John Halls, Bruce Palmers, Kevin Cross, all those guys. In the 70s, the majority of boards sold were made around here. 
and then if they weren't from around here they'd come up from cornwall from from the you know the bilbos and places like that or they came from swansea you know a guy called dave fryer had a shop but i'm pretty certain you know and tiki was a massive part of that so i think in those days the majority of the market was boards made in Britain, but often with Aussie influence, which was great because they'd come and, and brought that with them. Whereas if you do a snapshot of now and say how many shapers are in this valley or this little area now, we've mentioned Paul Blacker here over the road, a Jules at Gulfstream in, in Woolacum, and then a few smaller shapers dotted around. There was uh, Ellie Miller, the only woman shaper glasser finisher um she's now stopped doing that for health reasons so there's very few homegrown homemade boards i mean there'll always be some backyard ones Newquay, there's a bit more action but if you go and look if you do a quick survey of what's for sale in the shops that percentage has swung the other way now it's all manufactured boards um fire wires surf techs new surf projects um which has helped explode the sport of surfing for everyone so yeah it's it's changed the culture has changed the good thing is things like the museum of british surfing and now the guardians and have captured a lot of these older boards and stories and information um and it's there for everybody to see i mean i was um part of their set up for quite a while and managed to do their wetsuit story for them very right from the very first beaver tail wetsuits with yellow tape all the way through to you know the, the latest technology suits now so luckily the heritage is safe with um, the guys at the museum of british surfing and uh, you can go and check it out yeah, it's in Braunton. In the yeah, British right by the main car park. And uh, it's not expensive to, to get in there. And I always used to say when I was on the front desk, I said, you can do this in five minutes, five hours or five days. It depends how deep you want to go in to the information. But uh, it is a fantastic place and it's all there to see. And, uh, you know, when you think that, you know, Captain Cook, I think, first discovered surfing in Hawaii, you know, the Brits have got quite a lot to do with surfing. And I quite liked it when I went to Hawaii just briefly there, that there's a Union Jack tucked away in the top of their flag. You know, America likes to think Hawaii's, you know, all theirs. Well, it's not. Check the flag out. Check the, the history out. I'm sure we were probably more bad than good, but that's history. And, um, you know, the Brits belong there. And uh, it's good that the, the surf culture is alive and kicking here in North Devon. Where do you see surfing going? And I know it's quite a broad, broad question, but because you've got so much input now, as in visual input, where, you know, it's really easy to access watching people surfing all around the world, whether it's on social media, YouTube, you've got all these different online magazines now, because magazines have kind of slowly tethered out a little bit where they've got... Yeah a bunch of content that's on there, whether it's like Mason Ho or Coco Ho doing the stab, yeah. um, the stab in the dark stuff. Um, do, you, do you feel that that's a good influence on it? Or is it just opening like Pandora's box where there is just so many different options that it's quite confusing for people as well? I think surfing is always about freedom and expression of your thoughts expression of your movement i think keep surfing as free as it wants to be and don't worry about constraints because people will either vote with their feet or their viewing figures and you know if 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 something on there gives somebody pleasure and it stimulates them to get up and go surfing and or try a new trick you go i can't believe what that person has just done that air or that carve turn or whatever if it's on there and you can study it i mean that's how i learned some of my freestyle stuff in scotland on skiing we used to rewind this 16 millimeter projector over and over again to see what freestyle snow trick this guy had done and then go and practice it ourselves so no, I think, you know, as I say, a picture's worth a thousand words. So if somebody's doing something exciting and you can see it 
and it motivates you to go and improve, then yeah, let surfing be free. Let it go where it's going. I don't think you can control it. It's and I mean, everywhere's getting crowded. Everybody's getting a bit pissed off. But I just say get creative. I mean, I've even noticed at Saunton now the surf school's doing surf tours. Quite like the idea of that. Beach is packed. Line up at the cave has got 200 surfers on it. If they're doing a surf tour down the beach, I'd almost pay money to jump on that Land Rover. I'll give them 10 quid. Drop me off down there. You know, you just hike with your board over the dunes you know end up at the other end of Saunton you know middle beach Woolacombe you know a little bit unfashionable but great waves so yeah I think you just go and get creative go searching I've come to sort of like a an epiphany really about about this area and I had a conversation a while ago because um I've been part of the uh, the Navy surf team for about 18 years and um, a lot of the guys are, are based down sort of like the Cold Rose area down by Helston. So they, they primarily surf sort of like South Cornwall. Yeah. And what I've come to realize is that the majority of the breaks down there are, you know, beaches. You know, you've got, you've got Port Levin, which is, you know. Grass sands. Yeah, bright. but it, it's just hoppers when it's pumping. Mm. Uh, and loads of other places around there. But up here in the Devon area, not just North Devon, you know, you've got East Devon, South Devon, you know, Banth, the, the Bantam area, the, there are so many different types of break, whether it's reef, beach, points, points. Oh, yeah. there's so many different places that you just have to kind of either, you know, work your way into the the um the, the sort of like the circles yeah. to find out where they are or just look on the map and, and go and make look, your own and go and way. And the past sort of like year, I've enjoyed surfing so much more because I'm not going to those cliched names. I'm not mm. just going to Swanton. I'm not just going to Croydon. I'm not going to mention the other names because I'm going to ruin it for myself. No, I don't no, want no. anybody else to surf no, there. No, but no, exactly. No, that, but that's the whole thing about surfing, isn't it? It's it's the search is, is as much the fun and... Uh, in the end, you just find out where your peace of mind is and where you get the most enjoyment. And I think since I retired, my my mantra to myself is do more of what I enjoy. Don't let peer pressure or oh, I always do this or what's usual, what's normal. It's just apply one thing. What do I enjoy more of doing? And at whatever stage of your life you're at or you're surfing, I'm not going to use the word journey because it annoys me, but your surf <laughs> path, I hate that word. I'm on a journey. No, you're bloody not. Anyway, uh, just, you know, your surf path, just go to that place and, and do it. And for you, it's searching out these more special places and enjoying them. At my stage now, I tell you, it's an easy life. I, I run out of steam after about an hour and 20 minutes. The tank is empty. I'm running on fumes. No matter what I eat or put in my body, that's as long as it goes for. So I know where I want to surf and I go there. You know, you're younger, you got more energy that will take you to those places. So it's kind of an evolving situation. We used to, I think I've done 15 trips to Costa Rica. In the early days, we'd spent all our time racing up and down the coast. Fantastic. Through Rio's, it looked like something out of Top Gear, you know, jungles, monkeys, beaches with nobody on them. But we often arrived as the wind came up, the swell dropped, the tide was too high, the tide was too low. And then in the last five trips, I only go to one place now. And uh, I don't mind mentioning it, it's called Playa Guiones. It's three miles long. And if you like, it's Croyd at low tide, Woolacombe at mid tide and Saunton at high tide or whatever. It gets swell from the South Pole, the North Pole, and it all seems to converge there. Never seen it flat, but we now get more surf time by sticking to the one beach. That's me personally. Other people are still, you know, up and down the coast and they've got their special little secret spots to go to. So I think your surf path evolves and just do more of what you like doing. On the flip side of that, we're going to tie it up with a little bit of a five question quick fire round, if you don't mind, Eric. All oh, right. OK. OK. So the first question is, if you had one surfboard fin set up for the rest of your life, would it be a thruster, 
a twin fin, a single fin, a quad, bonza or finless? It's two plus one. I was going to say two plus one, but that's kind of cheating. <laughs> well, it's a thruster then. Okay. <laughs> but, but it's not. I mean, I've got a thruster on my short board and all my long boards are two plus one. Okay. And I think it's coming from my skiing and snowboarding background. I like to carve a turn. I love hard rails. I love the bite of the fins and the feeling of carving on a snowboard, a pair of skis. And I try and do what I call quality bottom turns. It's in my, and it's spooky that the, the leading surf magazine is called Carve. To me, a carved turn, forehand and backhand, that marks a good surfer. Look at their bottom turn, backhand and forehand. Sorry, that's a long answer. Well, that sets up for everything else, doesn't it? If you can't do that, then... Uh, yeah, exactly. Where are you going? Just wiggling. Straight handers and wiggle. Or Just some bounce. wiggles, yeah. Lots of body movement. And yeah, poo stances. Surfboards still doing a straight line. Yeah. Your favourite surfer and why? It's Slater. Love him or hate him. Um, I often have quite a debate with my uh, friend, Christian Dormer, who... Uh, helps me out with my vitamin pills and has turned into a good surf buddy. Uh, he's a Machado fan. I mean, I suppose I'm more of a hippie in in a way. It should be Machado, but for some reason, I just think Slater has done amazing things. So a bit of a cop-out. should be Machado, but I'm going Slater. Both different styles? Exactly. Both right out there. World class. Best and worst person to share a lineup with? Um, best person? Has it got to be one? You can say people if you Yeah, know. I mean, the best setup is when the Saunton Cave is on and there's four or five of us out there and everybody is just getting on and enjoying their surfing and not trying to nickel and dime waves off each other. It's when that there's sometimes just a magic blend and it can be a mixture of people, very good surfers, average surfers, men, women, juniors. But sometimes you just, you know, they appreciate the wave you're on. You appreciate the wave they're on. There's no hassling. It's all about the fun of going surfing. It's that. That's the magic moment. So like minded, mellow, surfing's fun type mindset people. That's. I know it's a bit of a cop out and a fudgy answer, <laughs> but it's what you just dream of having great surf with a good bunch of people and nobody nickel and diming you and trying to jibe you. And then worst is the people I've mentioned before, the marker boys and the drop ins. Pew. No words for them. Your favorite shaper and why? Right, that's dead easy because his name is Chops Lascelles and sadly he's no longer with us. He and I used to get on really well and he shaped all my longboards. I've still got that Jimi Hendrix one that you saw. That was by him and that was pre-shaping machines. The poor guy ended up with arthritic shoulders, elbow, wrist because all the blanks he hand sawed, all the planing and... Um, he was just the most fantastic person to go and meet because you didn't know what chops you were going to meet. You didn't know if you're going to meet Mr. Mellow, Mr. Revolutionary, or we're not shaping, we're going surfing. You never know what Mr. Chops you were going to meet. But his attention to detail for me was brilliant. You know, I used to like a certain rocker line in my boards and I didn't like a big rocker at the front because it kind of ploughed water. But I liked a, what I call a flick in the final six inches. Because if you're trying to nose ride, it just gave you that little warning that you're not right on the board and it would start spewing spray. And that was the warning to readjust and lock into the nose ride. And he'd get this thing called a rocker machine out. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a big, long, bendy bit of metal and it's got plungers and you plunge the plunger down to pick up the rocker line of the board. Okay. And then you transfer that to the blank that you're shaping so you can almost copy the rocker line that you had on the original board. Now, all of that 
has been superseded by shaping machines and the CAD CAM, where it's amazing. He'll go, now his son Marcus Lascelles has got all that because Chop set it up down at Beach Beat, where he said, well, with your rocker line, I'm going to now look for the blank that best matches that. And then I'll fine tune it on the on the shaping machine. So the attention, the detail that Chops did manually has now been mirrored by the shaping machine with with his son um, Marcus Lascelles. So yeah, that he is my number one shaper. And in fact, he came to me with Margaret River when we went over to with the Salomon Surf concept, and um, we had a bit of fun. We we ended up going to a vineyard tour with Greg Weber, the other shaper, who he's definitely different. He's, I don't know if he's Salvador Dali or whatever he is, or, <laughs> or, or the guy who chopped his ear off. He, he was definitely a creator. And he was delivering 50 boards to oh, one of the pro riders that was in the contest. I thought, how do you get delivered 50 boards? And, where, and what did you do with him? Oh, no, I saw what he did with him. I, I, I'm trying to recollect his name. His name's gone. His father was Dale. But anyway, Red Hot Surfer. Anyway, we saw what happened. He went round to this point break near where we were staying at Margaret River, and he had two boards under this arm and one under this arm, and it was a really shallow reef break that shot out into a bit of sand. And obviously it was a full-in barrel. You know, you're in the barrel or you're in the rocks. It was that choice. It was that close. He came back with six bits. Three boards became six. That was one practice session. And that's why Greg Weber was delivering 60. But anyway, I got a picture of me and him and Chops tasting wine in Western Oz. And uh, yeah, good, happy memories with Chops. Miss the fella. Uh, if you had one wave to surf for the rest of your life, where would that be? When I say wave, I mean location. Yeah, my British hat on. It's a Saunton cave wave head high, which only I can screw it up. That wave is perfect at the cave at that point in the tide. And I will get 200 to 300 yards out of that to ankle deep water. And it will have peeled all the way. Cut backs off the top all the way through. That's my British hat. <laughs> Worldwide. Playa Guiones, Costa Rica. So Eric, I know you've got a YouTube channel. Uh, where pe where can people find it? What's it under? And uh, what other things have you got that people can tap into too? So here's a cheeky little plug. Um, if you look up Eric Davis on YouTube, that's D-A-V-I-E-S, and uh, search for Road to India, you can see our trip to the Himalayas, where we went overland, um, all through Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all quite interesting, even back then. All filmed on a clockwork camera, so in this world of Bluetooth, it's uh, quite interesting to have dragged that up there. And we climbed a mountain, um, 6,000 metres. Uh, if you want to see a shortened version of that, because uh, that one's uh, 20 minutes, you can see a five-minute version if you look up Peacemaker by Jack Besant, um, he's used my film uh, to his excellent music. And uh, also on my little YouTube channel, you can have a, a little look at a, a Saunton wave, a Costa Rican wave, and uh, even a bit of skiing to uh, inspire you to get out there and do stuff. Perfect. I'll put all of those links into the uh, podcast bio that everyone can uh, tap into and have a little click on. Eric Davis, thank you so much for spinning some stories today. And I've appreciated them, mate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I feel honoured and uh, I'm still impressed by these microphones. Uh, it's definitely gone up a level in me, uh, me legend and blogging life here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. Cheers. And that's it. If you like the podcast, please like, share and subscribe on your podcast provider and also leave a little review on Apple Podcasts. Next week's podcast will be with a former Royal Marine and film producer and director, Emile Giesen. So tune in for that one. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.